I was, um, I've been thinking this week, it just, it just seems like we've been inundated with news uh, that is troubling, which whatever your views are on just about everything, most of the news that we get is like jarring, you know, fires and fights and wars and all this stuff. But this morning, I want you to shut all that out because I've got good news for you. Got good news. And I think God is going to meet us this morning. At least that's my prayer. Most of you probably know uh, comedic actor Danny DeVito. He is the current pitch man of Jersey Mike's subs, right? And he's the, the little guy that kind of stands at the counter and he's looking over the counter at all the things they're making, you know, and he's. He's drooling. But in his younger days, he appeared on a sitcom, television sitcom, by, that was called Taxi. And in it, he played a character by the name of Louis De Palma. I love that name, Louis De Palma. And he is kind of that. He, he reminds me in a lot of ways. I mean, Louis was the, the deceptive sneaky, snarky, devious dispatcher at the taxi company. And uh, he was the guy that everybody loved to hate. While the ensemble cast would sit around, and they were all, they're all, you know, largely famous people later on now, but they would sit around and they were joking with each other and they were friends and they were making plans and dreams and, you know, before they got sent out on their assignments. And Louis, Louis was always kind of on the periphery. He was always kind of listening in on what was going on and, and you know, thinking of ways he could use what they said against them. And he was the kind of guy that, um, you know, he was often the butt of their jokes. Louis was not very lovable, nor was he very likable. Perhaps you know a Louis de Palma in your life. Hopefully they're not sitting next to you. He was the kid that no one wanted on their, their team because he couldn't catch a fly ball. She's the kind of coworker that never quite fits in, and so she rarely gets invited to stay on after work or go out for, you know, a get-together after, after work. Often, they're people that we secretly despise, but because we profess Christ, we know that we shouldn't say we despise people. But way too often, we do. By any definition, Louis de Palma was an outcast. The Oxford Dictionary defines an outcast as a person who has been rejected by society or some social group. Outcasts come in all shapes and sizes, in all personalities. But they all share a common pain, and that is the pain of rejection. The pain of loneliness. Here's my big idea this morning. I'll get to it right away. My big idea is this, Jesus loves the outcast. So can we. And maybe I should say, do we? Do we love the outcast? Do we love the person that we just as soon not be around? You see, the emptiness of rejection is one of life's most primal fears. The fear of rejection drove my life for years. Wanting to be loved, wanting to be known, wanting to be heard. And it can't be filled with money. 
It can't be filled with power. It can't be filled with success. It is a bottomless pit of need that you just can't fill in any other way than to really be seen and heard and loved for who you are as a human being. Three weeks ago when I talked, I introduced the character, reintroduced probably for many of you, the character Bartimaeus. And uh, in that message, this is the second half of a two-part series, by the way. It's just separated by a couple of weeks. And we said, if we're going to love like Jesus, you know, we wear the wear the arm, the wristbands and everything. We're going to love like Jesus. We have to see people the way Jesus saw people. And what we saw in Bartimaeus is that Jesus saw a person who needed honor and hope and healing. Bartimaeus was an up or a down and outer. He was at the, uh, the margins of society. This morning I want to introduce an individual that's an up and outer. Somebody who, though, though they knew power and they had wealth, was an outcast. And I believe shared the feelings of rejection that so many feel. But Jesus saw him differently. In fact, he shows us, by the way he sees him, three ways that we can see the Louis de Palmas in our world, in our life. And you may have a face in your mind's eye of someone. His story is told in Luke chapter 19. And so if you have your Bible, I want you to open that, or I'd encourage you to open it, and follow along. But before we do... Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give us your eyes today and your heart for the outcasts, the people that although they annoy us or we just would rather not have to deal with them, you love them. Help us to see them with your eyes and act accordingly. I pray, Father, that the words of my mouth this morning and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus entered Jericho, the text tells us, and he was passing through. These events immediately follow, or depending on the timing of the whole thing, we aren't exactly sure, but it was in the very same, on the very same trip through Jericho that he had just either met Bartimaeus or he's going to meet him on the other end. But in, in Jericho, as he's passing through, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. You say Zacchaeus, I say Zacchaeus. I, I get it confused. So if, I'm, if I switch back and forth, it's the same guy, Okay. Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being short, he could not because of the crowd. And so he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming this way. Now, as I had talked about in the story of Bartimaeus, Jericho was an extremely wealthy community. We find Jesus and his entourage on the way to Jerusalem and his destiny with the cross. He comes through Jericho, this town that we, I mentioned is kind of like we would consider Palm Springs. It's the winter home of the wealthy and the powerful, the royals. And there also happened to be a guy there by the name of Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector in the area. And to, to explain that a little bit, you've got to understand that the Roman imperial government did not have an IRS. They had an IES. 
They didn't have an internal revenue service. They had an imperial extortion service. Now, some of you might be thinking, so what's the difference? The difference is this, that he was the chief tax collector over the area of Jericho. He had tax collectors that worked under him, kind of a multi-level marketing deal, okay? Each tax collector took their take from the people. They always overcharged because... They had a certain amount they had to pay. They'd charge more. They'd cut, you know, would, would take a cut of it. And then Zacchaeus, he would take another cut of them. And so this was a man who was raking in money, and he was exceedingly, exceedingly wealthy. This made him a very rich, rich man by abusing his power, of his office and charging more than he was due and pocketing the difference. But here's the deal. He was a collaborator with the Romans and therefore he was an outcast. He was hated. He used his own people. He was trading on his own people, his understanding of the culture, and he was despised. He was a man that we would say sold his soul for a few pieces of silver. Only it was a lot more than a few pieces of silver. He was a wealthy outcast, despised by the people that he was raised around. And you know what's ironic? If Bartimaeus was the man whose name meant son of honor, Zacchaeus is a man whose name means Innocent, pure, and he was anything but. We have a funny relationship with wealthy people in our culture, I think. Most of us would like to be wealthy, but we don't want to be known as wealthy. Ameriprise Financial did a survey in 2019 and they surveyed 3,000 people, affluent Americans between the ages of 30 and 69, who had at least $100,000 in investable assets. Of those 3,000, 700 were millionaires, okay? Of the group of millionaires, when asked how they would describe their economic status, only 13% would admit that they were wealthy. In fact, 3% thought they were poor. I don't know where they live, but... There's this, there's this tension that we have that we feel like sometimes we, we resent rich people because we think they don't deserve it or they got it unjustly, right? Right? There's, there, there's this, this mentality. But guess what, folks? If you're alive in this country or you were born in this country, you are among probably the 10% most wealthy people that have ever lived on the planet, even if you're homeless. We are wealthy. We just don't realize it. We don't like it. We don't like to think we are. Because we associate things often, you know, Paul said to, to, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, it is the love of money, not money, but it is the love of money that is the root of all sorts of evil because it leads us to places we don't go. In fact, in Mark chapter 10 and verse 25, Jesus says it's nearly impossible or it is impossible for a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, he says it's so difficult in Mark 10, 25 that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Zacchaeus was a wealthy man and he was clearly not on the path to heaven. We also notice from the text something else about Zacchaeus. How can I say this? He was vertically challenged. He was small. He was a short guy. And, and because he was short, Jesus comes into town, 
And in spite of all his money and all his power, he can't get a seat at the front of the crowd for the parade. And so he does two very undignified things. The first thing he does is he runs. He runs down the street figuring, okay, he's coming this way. I know, ah, there we go. He runs, and in that culture, only children ran. Interesting. But he runs, very undignified, lifted his, his gown. He does the second thing. He climbs the tree. And in that culture, only children climb trees. And I'm figuring that, you know, Zacchaeus runs it down. It's a sycamore fig tree. These are trees that grow to almost up to 40 feet tall. I've got a variant of a sycamore tree in my backyard, and I'm sick of that sycamore. <laughs> it's dropping, my neighbor's is dropping stuff all the time, but it has great branches. And so I envision Zacchaeus thinking, okay, and he runs, he climbs this tree along with half the neighbor's kids, half the village kids are probably up in the tree. And I just have this vision of Louis de Palma hanging onto a limb, looking down, waiting for Jesus to come. Why? Why does he do that? I think he does that because he's lonely, he's been rejected probably repeatedly, and I believe this is what Jesus sees in him. This is the first way that Jesus sees him that's differently. And that is very simply this. I think Jesus saw his openness more than his reputation. I think Jesus saw his, his desire to learn, his, his willingness to say, you know, I don't get it. I'm, I, this isn't working for me. Maybe there's something else. Jesus saw that. More than his reputation. We tend to see people for their reputation, for good or for bad. And that locks us in sometimes. But the emptiness of his rejection, I think over the years, made him curious enough to say he wanted to know what this rabbi had that he wanted. See, I believe he wanted to be seen and loved as a human being. I knew a guy in, in Texas years ago who was the, the epitome of the American dream. He, be, he, became, he went from rags to riches. He, he started a business. It took off and made him a multimillionaire over the years. And he, you know what he said after he had been rich for a certain length of time? He says, the only, thing I, only problem I have is I never know if people want to know me because of my money or for who I am. And I think Zacchaeus had some of those same feelings. He wanted to know how people felt about him or whether they were loved for his money. And climbing that tree, running and climbing that tree was an act of desperation that I think Jesus recognized because not everybody would do that. Not everybody is desperate enough to want to know what it is that Jesus had. So let's continue. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he was welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and they began to mutter. Hmm, typical. He has gone off to be the guest of a sinner. <laughs> now, did you notice something? Did you notice where did Jesus stop? The spot. 
the text tells us. Not just any spot. The spot. And he looked up and he said, Louie, come on down, man. I want to hang with you for the day. I got to come to your pad. Come on down. Let's go. And, and, and you know, and Zacchaeus is going, uh, okay. And he comes down gladly. Now, don't get too hung up on the fact that Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house. Because there were a lot of self-righteous people that would have loved, dozens probably in that crowd, who would have loved to have Jesus at their house that day. Because it was a, you know, I, I, I can't tell you what all their thinking was, but I know many of them in the crowd thought Jesus was showing up to toss the Romans and I'll bet you some of them are thinking, you know, if the Romans get tossed out, that's going to make it tough on Herod. Herod might have to put his estate up for sale, and there might be some real real estate bargains in Jericho. That wasn't the case. You see, Jesus saw something in his openness and his willingness to be, and, and desire to be seen. Not only that, he saw a divine appointment. That's the second thing. Jesus saw a divine appointment more than an interruption. That's why I say, you're here this morning, not by chance. <laughs> you're here because God brought you here. I believe that. I believe that. Jesus stopped at the spot, looked up, he sees him, and I think, I think Zacchaeus was stunned because he probably had never had a rabbi, an esteemed rabbi, a rabbi that people were floating the word Messiah about, speak to him in a kind voice or wanted to associate with him. Zacchaeus comes down. It would be the equivalent of seeing Jesus go off to some drug dealer's house. That's how they felt about Zacchaeus. He's gone off to have dinner at a mob boss's house. What? See, to break bread in that culture was a symbol of fellowship. It was a symbol of closeness. It was a bond, of, a, a relational bond was established. You didn't just have anybody over in that context. And, and they were saying, what's he doing? You see, my guess is Zacchaeus was initially just as stunned. Because someone actually saw him for the first time maybe in a long, long time. They actually saw him and wanted to know him. They, they wanted to be with him, not for his money. And they didn't want to be with him to, to criticize his sin, which he was fully aware of. But they just wanted to be with him. See, people, that, you think that the people that annoy you in life are annoyances. They're interruptions in the life that you want to control and you can't. But they're not annoyances. They are divine appointments. They are divine appointments. Sometimes the people that we need to spend the most time with are the people that are nothing like us. We don't like that. We like to be with people that are like us, don't we? We all think the same thing. We all agree on the same things. And yet, that's not going to change the kingdom. We need to spend time with those that are nothing like us so that we might see them by listening to them and hearing their hurts and their pain and their story and how they came to where they are. 
to reinforce their humanity. You know, it is so easy to dismiss people that are different from ourselves. That's why we always watch Fox News or CNN or MSN, depending on your political perspective. But we need to spend time with people who differ from ourselves. To dismiss them and dismiss their sin as really bad. You ever notice that? People who sin like me, I don't think are so bad. It's the people that sin differently than I do that I think are really bad. That's not true. (laughs) That's not true. And if you don't believe that, Jot down Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. Read the section on murder and adultery, and you tell me that your sin is any less than somebody else's. The consequences may differ, but the sin in God's eyes. Jesus saw Zacchaeus as a divine appointment. He wasn't an interruption on his way to to saving the world. Because this is how he saves the world. One sinner at a time. One sinner at a time. So Jesus saw his openness more than his reputation. He saw a divine appointment more than an interruption. But there's a third thing he saw. Look at verse 8. The text says, but Zacchaeus stood up. And it's like, well, wait a minute. He came down, he was, he was standing there with Jesus. And then the text says he stood up. It's not like somebody in the back, you know, always they kid short people. Hey, Louie, stand up. What do you mean I am standing? No, I think there's a gap between verse 7 and verse 8. Because if you notice, it says at the end of verse 7, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. So they had departed. And what I think has happened is they've gone to Zacchaeus' house and conversations have begun and a meal has been served and perhaps sometime in the midst of that or just after that was over, we don't know exactly the timing. Verse 8 says, but Zacchaeus stood up. And he said to the Lord, Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor and half I, and, I, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, and believe me, he had. This is not a conditional if, if this has happened. He's saying, this happened. If I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times. Not just going to make him good, make it good. I want to make it really good. I'm going to pay him back four times. And I'm guessing he had elaborate records that he kept and he could tell. And by that very statement, I'm guessing that what he was saying was he really was willing to sell everything he had to make things right. Now, this is where we need to understand something. He said, he, he says that. And Jesus then says to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. This man too is a son of Abraham. You see, what we need to understand is when Jesus told the rich young ruler that he had to sell everything he had and come follow him, that's not how he got saved. We are never saved by our works. We are never saved by doing good things, although we're supposed to do good things. See, this statement and what would follow was not what saved Zacchaeus. Salvation has come to this house today. What saved him was faith. It always has been. It always will be. We are saved by grace, through faith, This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. And you say, well, how do you get that? Because he says, this 
He says to him, this man too is now a son of Abraham. And in the, the, the uh, Old Testament, Abraham in Jewish culture, Abraham is the symbol of faith. If you, if you look at Hebrews chapter 11 and you see the, uh, uh, the, what was often called the hall of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, he is at the center of that chapter and it says three different paragraphs, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Abraham. What he's saying is this too, this man now, he's no longer an outcast. He's part of the family. He is also a son of Abraham. And how are we sons of Abraham? By faith. By faith. By faith in the one that was standing in front of Zacchaeus. By faith in the Messiah. By faith in what he would do for him at the cross. What it's telling us is that Jesus saw his potential more than his past. Jesus saw that in Zacchaeus, not who he was, but he saw his potential more than what he was at that particular time. You see, by, even by... Even Louis de Palma, the Louis de Palmas of the world, are saved and by faith. And the people that are in your life that you think, oh man, they're never going to come to faith. Maybe you've been praying for them for years and years and years and years and years, and they just kind of go bumping along. They are saved by faith. Louis de Palma is exhibit A that a camel can go through the eye of a needle. Or should I say, Zacchaeus went through the eye of a needle. See, Christ's mission was in Mark chapter 10, or in, in, uh, got confused. Anyway, Christ's mission was to seek and save the lost. That's what verse 10 tells us to seek and save what was lost. His mission was not to make good people better. His mission was not to, but to make sinful people new. His mission was that lost people might be found. His mission was that dead people might be alive by faith in Christ. And that faith in Christ changes the way we see our life. And we are able then. Men and women, Jesus sees us not for what we have become. Listen to this. This is important. When Jesus sees you and me and the Louis de Palmas of the world, he does not see us for what we have become, but for what we will become by faith. He doesn't see us for what we have become. He sees us for what we will become by faith. And that's why I say... He saw in Zacchaeus this potential and it was, it's lived out in the way he responds. Jesus saw his openness, not so much his reputation. He saw him as a divine appointment, not an interruption. And he see, saw his potential more than his past. Now you're thinking to yourself, okay, but here's the deal, Mark. I'm Louis de Palma. (laughs) The Louis de Palma in your life may be the one that's looking at you in the mirror every morning. The one that you feel rejected. You feel empty. You feel like you don't belong. You don't fit in. Maybe you're here this morning and that's, it's not the people that come into your life that are the problem, maybe we are the problem. We are the one that something is missing. And the fear of rejection has driven you all of your life, as it did me, to succeed, to make money, to gain power, to pursue pleasure, to make myself a success. Maybe this morning... 
You're here by divine appointment because you're the one that needs to know that God doesn't look at you by what you have become. He looks at you by what you can become or will become by faith. Jesus is here right now. He's right, he's right here. His spirit is hovering over this place. And he's saying to you and to me, Louis, Mark, Mary, Jim, Brenda, whatever your name is, I'm here. And I must stay at your house today. I need to come in and stay with you and bring my healing and my hope to your life. I know everything about you. I know everything about you. And I still love you. I want to come in. I want to hang with you. I want to be a part of your life. And I promise you, I will never reject you. You'll never be an outcast anymore to me, Jesus says. You're a part of the family when we step into that circle, that circle of faith. I will never reject you. Let that sink in. I will never reject you, Jesus is saying to you. I will never, ever reject you by faith. Trust me. Will you trust me? Let's pray. Lord, I know that there are folks here today that feel like they're the outcast, like they're the one on the outside that doesn't get it, and that people, for whatever reason, don't want to be around them. Father, I pray this morning that your spirit would speak to their heart. Maybe for the first time. Maybe, it's, maybe you've been a, a, a believer for a long time and you just have kind of lost the desire or you're just kind of going through the motions. Or Lord, that maybe this is the first time that they ever feel like that they've really been seen by you and heard and known. Father, I pray that you would speak to their hearts right now and touch them and let them know that they are loved more than they could ever imagine. I pray that, Father, that you would, by your spirit, that they would open your hearts to you. Right now, right here, today, this divine appointment, that they would, Father, that they would open their hearts and and say, Lord, forgive me. I've made a mess of my life. You see that. You know that. Cleanse me, I pray, Father, from my sin, my pride, and my arrogance, and my unwillingness to become like a child. Climb a tree. Ask for help. Father, we know that if we do that, if we come to you with a heart that is open and repentant, you will receive us. So, Father, I pray that there's folks in this room and online today that do that for maybe for the very first time or at least maybe it's a, a recommitment of that. Jesus is saying, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never reject you. Open your heart to me. In Jesus' name I pray.